Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's a real honor and a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to start by thanking Imro for this award. It's a real, real honor. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, which means, as Brandon mentioned earlier, I study the brain to try and figure out how the mind works. And I'm particularly interested in a symptom of serious mental illness, delusions. These are the fixed false beliefs that uh, characterize serious mental illnesses uh, like schizophrenia. Here's an example of a delusion. Uh, this is somebody suffering from what we call the Capgras delusion. A 74-year-old married housewife diagnosed with psychosis because she believes that her husband has been replaced by another unrelated man. She refuses to sleep in the same room as the imposter, and she locks herself in her bedroom, and she asks her son to procure a gun for her. So this is a belief, it's driving her action, it's changing her behavior, and it's clearly something that's quite distressing for her. And for many years, we thought that these types of beliefs were ununderstandable in terms of neuroscience, but with the explosion of neuroscientific work in the past 10 years, we've been able, I think, to get a handle on how beliefs form and how delusions might form. And I'd like to share that work with you now. And I'm really excited to have the opportunity with this award to take that work and try and turn it into something palpable, uh, a real treatment uh, for, for delusional beliefs. Now, this is someone who might be quite familiar to you. This is a hollow mask of Charlie Chaplin, and I want to show you the profound effect that our prior beliefs have on how we perceive the world. So this is a hollow mask of his face. You'll see it's rotating uh, clockwise, but something odd's gonna start happening soon. So the face is rotating around. You start to see the inside of the mask, and hopefully something unusual will start to occur. Anyone notice something? It looks like the face has changed direction. Right? And that's because going around the world, our very strong belief, our prior experiences, faces point out into the world. They don't point inwards. And that experience changes our sensory processing and overrides how we see the world. And I, that's how I see delusions. They might be maladaptive and incorrect, but they definitely impact on how patients see the world. How does that work in the brain? Well, the visual information enters through your eye. It's communicated down your optic nerve, and it ends up in your sensory cortices at the back of the brain. And we think at the back of the brain, there's still a little bit of information pertaining uh, to that face pointing inwards. But higher regions in your brain, like the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which we'll talk about in, in a much greater detail, send beliefs in a top-down way that sort of overrides your sensory processing in, that, in those lower areas of your brain. And we think that patients with psychosis forming their delusions, this mechanism doesn't work. They can't use their prior expectancies to constrain how they see the world in the same way. And we'd like to do something to try and fix that. This isn't me without my glasses, although this is somebody British. This is Thomas Bayes. Now, Thomas Bayes was a mathematician and a clergyman from the 17th century, and he came up with a very clever statistical idea that summarizes the idea that we learn from our mistakes. We learn most in, a, in situations when our mistakes are greatest. Um, but we also, uh, how we think about the world and how we think about data is very much driven by our expectations. And we think this theory is encapsulated even in how the brain works and even in how single neurons fire. I'd like you to join me in a thought experiment just to illustrate the profound effect that prior expectancies have on how our beliefs form. I'd like you to imagine that you're an allergist, okay? And your job is to figure out the causes of allergic reactions in a fictitious patient. I'm gonna show you meals that he's eaten, and I'm gonna show you whether or not he has an allergy. So you see that he eats a hamburger, okay? And you see that he suffers an allergic reaction, and you see this repeatedly, hamburger, allergy, hamburger, allergy. You might start to believe that hamburgers cause allergic reactions in this fictitious patient. You then see that hamburger and banana paired together, and they also cause the allergic reaction. And the question is, what do you learn about the banana? Now, having already learned that hamburgers cause allergy, you have a strong prediction that uh, the allergy is going to happen. You don't learn anything new from the banana being there. There's no prediction error, there's no surprise, there's no need to update your belief. And in a nutshell, our model for how delusions form is that there's too much prediction error in the world, prediction error system in the brain is overactive and that makes you attend to and learn about the banana and form beliefs about the banana in ways that everyone else would simply ignore. And this is a phenomenon called blocking. It was discovered in the 1960s uh, in, by a psychologist in rodents, so we can study it across species too and we've been doing some of that work also. Now we do exactly the same task in the fMRI scanner. We have subjects lying on their backs, they observe the foods that Mr. X has eaten, 
They make a prediction about what they think will happen using a button box, and we show them whether or not he suffered an allergy. And that means we can set up expectations across series of trials, and we can either confirm or violate those expectations. And we track changes in blood flow to different parts of the brain when we violate their expectations, that's our activation condition, and when we confirm their expectations. And what I'm going to show you is a series of plots of the difference between uh, having one's expectancies violated and having one's expectancies confirmed. What we're looking at here is the response in healthy control subjects. So the, the amount of activation in this region of right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, what you're looking at is a slice, the first, the first image is a slice sideways, then top down, and then this way in this plane through the top of the head. And you see that in response to events that violate one's expectations, there's a nice strong engagement of activation in this region. But in patients with first episode psychosis, there's a blurring of the distinction in terms of this region's response between surprising and unsurprising events. And I think that maps really nicely onto people's experiences of psychosis. That is, important things in the world don't seem quite as important, and things in the world that everyone else would tend to ignore seem to take on a sort of irrepressible significance. And that's what I think drives delusion formation. And this is why I think that, because if we quantify the difference in responses to those different types of events, it correlates really strongly with the severity of people's delusional beliefs. Now, that's really nice, but I wanted to use that in a way that might help patients. And as I mentioned, we think that even single neurons in the brain have this predictive capacity. They make predictions about the stimuli that are going to be incoming upon them by shuttling different forms and different functional ion channels into their membrane and changing the receptivity to, to inputs. And one of the channels that's really important are potassium ion channels. They regulate the baseline activity of cells and their responsivity to inputs. Are they relevant to psychosis? Well, yes, they are. This, almost in an episode of House, this is a patient that we dealt with, in, uh, in, we worked with in, in, in Cambridge when I was doing my PhD. This was somebody whose immune system was raising antibodies to his own potassium ion channels. His own body was blocking those channels that we think are really important for psychosis, and he was in, experiencing psychotic symptoms. He felt like uh, people in the hospital were plotting against him, um, and once we gave him plasmapheresis, once we got rid of those antibodies from his body, uh, the psychosis went away permanently. So we think those channels are pretty important for how we specify predictions about the world. When they're blocked, people's experiences of the world is very much driven by the, what's coming in bottom up. It's unfiltered by expectations and context, just like Sophia mentioned. And we think that if we can restore the function of those channels, we might be able to uh, remedy that, that top-down activation. And we're going to do that with a drug called Trobalt or Ritigabine. This is a drug that's already FDA approved, so we don't have to go through the rigmarole of, of developing it and getting it approved by the FDA. It's approved for the treatment of uh, epilepsy, and it causes those channels to open for a greater length of time. With the money from the Rising Star Award, I'm going to give people in an experimental setting, experimental medicine design like Sophia described, we're going to scan people's brains before they go into the scanner. We're going to record that aberrant prediction error signal. We're going to treat them for six weeks with this drug, and we're going to scan them again to see if the prediction error firing has been normalized by this treatment and whether or not their symptoms get better. In terms of animal models, we can record from cells that we think really signal this prediction error. Um, we can give drugs that really engage in appropriate firing of, the, of those signals, drugs like amphetamine or ketamine, and we can give rotigamine, and we see that it dose-dependently decreases the overactivity of those, of those cells. So it's, again, relevant to the, the, the circuit and the process that we're interested in, in animal models. And what I'm going to do with the award is translate that into the clinic. So our hope is that we'll replicate these effects that we see in first episode patients, that we'll treat them with the drug, and that we should be able to increase their responding to things that ought to violate their expectancies, decrease their responding to run-of-the-mill and highly predictable control events, and hopefully, by doing this, remedy their delusional beliefs. And as I mentioned, we're hoping to restore this top-down ability to use our prior experiences to regulate what we're currently experiencing. So I'll, summar I'll stop there and summarize and say that I've talked to you about delusion formation as an aberration of causal beliefs and causal belief formation through association. It's driven by these inappropriate surprises or prediction errors processed by that region of right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that seems so key. Um, 
this work has inspired a novel treatment for psychosis that's based on opening those potassium channels. And I'm going to test that treatment using imaging, our imaging biomarker and our clinical data and see whether or not we can restore people's, uh, how they learn about the world and how they form beliefs. And I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. I'll thank my collaborators and the people in my lab. And again, I'd like to thank Imro and the Staglins for, for the award. So thank you.